Blah, y'all already know what it is, your boy Yako. What it do? The outlet to reality, the holders podcast in Vegas and Chicago. What up? This is the place where you want to hide from your drama or maybe hide from your baby mama. Aha, just kidding. But, anyways, fans, thank you for staying tuned. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Cha-ching! And today we have a very, very special guest who's a good friend. Give it up for Robert Seinberg, who is known for the Tribune sometimes. And we got a lot to tell. So thanks for coming. <laughs> oh, it's a great seeing you, man. It's been a while. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How could you leave Chicago? It's only 19 degrees here. You know what? It's funny you said that. I, I felt like I do miss the food. I miss, you know, the people. I just felt like I needed like a new start. Right. You know, something different, a new challenge. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, Robert and I, we go way back. Robert knows me since I was young, like a young kid. Um, I was like about 12-ish. Uh, we went to the same shul, same synagogue. And interesting enough, you know, I was the only Hispanic at the shul. And being a young kid, it was very interesting because uh, everyone was older than me. You know, everyone was already finished college. They're, you know, living their life. And I feel like you learn more. People that are more wiser, you're always going to learn more. And what was interesting is that uh, we were always struggling to have a minion. Uh, a quorum of 10 people um we always had nine and i was the 10th person that they needed right so at first going to the shore i wasn't counted in the minion and eventually uh our rabbi was able to get a letter uh, from his teacher where i was able to be counted for the shul and it's so interesting because um back then we were struggling so much that uh, my old teacher, Herb Timer, he and a, a lot of the members will go outside to ask people walking by, hey, are you Jewish? First thing they would say, just so we can have a, a minion, because in order to be counted, you have to be Jewish and your mom has to be Jewish. And so I remember that. And eventually, you know, ever since getting that letter, it really opened the doors because you know, uh, I start bringing my family, um, my friends, and now looking forward, you know, I just went back to Chicago literally uh, a week and a half ago. And it was so nice to see how the show has changed a lot. Now it's so diverse. Uh, I was telling Robert on the phone that it's now like 40% Hispanic. and um, 20% Hasidic and the rest Ashkenaz. So it's so nice to see a very nice, diverse, you know, um, you could say congregation. It was beautiful. And uh, like Robert said on the phone, I was like the, the first pioneer, you know, to, to break the ice. <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, you, you, I think the, the, Hispanic or Latino, you know, part of the congregation really brought a passion and a seriousness that, you know, gave it kind of a, a unique flavor. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I mean, um, you know, I, I think I think we all gain because of that. Mm -hmm. you it, know? It, but it yeah, you were you were young and, and what what brought you there that day? So I'm going to be honest, my aunt, who's very close to uh, the community, she knows her timer very well. So she was the one who got me my foot in the door to the shul. And um, I was very, you know, when I went there the first time, I'm not going to lie, Robert, a lot of people don't know this part of the story, but um, I got there early and I forgot the guy's name, who timer. And what people didn't know is that Herb Timer actually, uh, he came extra late for Shabbat. And so I came in and hoping to meet this guy who I forgot. And um, the rabbi, you know, spoke to me, pulled me to the side. 
and told me I couldn't stay for Shabbat. And it broke my heart and I was sad. And um, my aunt gets a call from Herb Timer and Herb Timer's like, where was your nephew? I never saw him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? <laughs> yeah. And so that's that's kind of how I was able to, you know, meet everybody. But I, I felt like, you know, being a young kid, I mean, isn't that crazy, Robert? You know, I was about 12 and 13. Right. And, and now I'm, I'm about to be 30. Right. Right. Well, you know, um, I remember you, you know, you, you really and you brought that great smile and everything and, you know, and that contagious kind of, you know, personality. Um, we should point out that the rabbi of that synagogue or shul, he's a very warm, you know, outgoing guy. And I, I think that, that, you know, that adds to the mix. You know, he's a really kind of down at home person. He was a, uh, I believe, an Air Force chaplain. So he, you know, he, he dealt with people of, you know, different levels of observance and everything. So all together, it has a really nice feel to it. Oh, yeah. And, and Robert, can I, can I ask you something? Because you've been at that show longer than me. How was it? back then before you know before i came of course and um was herb timer there for a while herb yeah herb um uh you know he eventually became the president um you know he herb um just a remarkable remarkable guy he and his wife his memory uh, should be blessed you know he I, I forget when he passed away it was a few years ago now but he, um, he had like a science background. I think he had been a minister at one time. If I, I may be wrong, but I think he actually was a minister, you know, and, um, you know, and, and, uh, and obviously uh, went in a uh, different direction. He had a pretty incredible story. So I don't know how you guys connected, if you just, you guys connected through school or through what? So when I, when I finally, my aunt, you know, explained to her that, uh, my nephew was looking for you and never found you. Um, and I was able to stay her timer said, uh, for Shabbat and we'll walk together to shul. So that way he won't get kicked out. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, I'll be with him. And so I went with him and it was so nice, you know, being with her timer, very tall, muscular, strong guy. And uh, you remember he had a dog, a really a big oh, dog. Oh, right, right, <laughs> right. And so we walked together. And to be honest with you, um, when we went in, um, you weren't there at, at, at the time. You, you right. I think you came later that day. But okay. during Shabbat, uh, some of the people that were there, they were like, why is he back? <laughs> and so Herb Timer, he says something, and they all stay quiet. Sure. And I was like, sure. yo, yo, Herb Timer, you like an angel because I don't know what you said. And so I sat next to him and I was like, Herb, what did you say that that made him, you know, stay quiet? And he goes, uh, I'm the I'm the vice president of the show, you know, so I have a lot of power. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what yeah. he said. I got a lot of power. <laughs> as far as power goes. Yeah. Yeah. So we go there and the rabbi comes and he goes, wow, you're you're back again. So. Uh, I explained to the uh, to Herb. I said, I Herb, how come I got kicked out?" He goes, "Well, you know, the Talmud says that uh, technically we're supposed to kick out somebody three times, but you're lucky with your charm. We we only kicked you out once. <laughs> so so we brought you back. But after that, uh, I'm gonna be honest with you. I was going through a lot um, school mentally." I was failing my science class, physics, chemistry, and body. And like you said, Herb has a background and he has a PhD in, in biology and uh, uh, the other background in chemistry. So he told my mom, you know, I, I'm willing to tutor David, you know, Yaakov, if he needs help after school. So I go in and this is very interesting. Herb Timer, he only charged my mom once. But after that, he never charged me again. And I will stay for two or three hours with him. And he was so brilliant that every tree that we walked by, he would tell you 
Okay, that's the name of the tree. Yeah. And I, and I could tell you what kind of medicine yeah. you can make out of that plant. Yeah. Yes. That's a great, that's a great little memory, memory there. You're, that's a, I forgot about that, you know. He did have that real scientific, you know, classification kind of background. And, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't realize, you're right, the Talmud wants, unlike some other religions, Judaism doesn't really seek converts. In fact, they try and discourage them at first because they know it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a challenge and everything. And, and boy, you really lived the experience. Right, no, I did, yeah. And, and it was so nice that, you know, uh, even at that time, um, when I wasn't really being, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't accepted yet, but I, I love that the rabbi will always invite me over for Shabbat meals on Shabbat. So he said, look, David, I have a lot of food. I don't want you to eat by yourself. Just come yeah. over. And that's, that's the family I love. I love the, yeah, you know, that feeling like you're part of something I think is beautiful yeah um i think one thing that you and i had in common you know i i got older i was in college and i saw you again and i was like you know robert I, i'm starting this tv show um remember i was telling you about it i i it was uh it's a youtube sitcom uh take one pass it back and you're like oh that's great you know keep going don't don't stop you know you're still young and you know keep it up and honestly you you and I would say you and Philip were one of the, the closest people that I felt very connected to. Uh, and also Herb Timer, of course. Um, but I, uh, but I do want to get into you because I know we're, we're getting into, you know, which is nice. I think it's very nice. Learning well, it's about. interesting. Sure. Yeah. So, Robert, I, I want to really pick at your brain. So so my fans will get to know you a little bit more. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background if you were born and raised in chicago your hobbies and what got you into journalism you know i um i i am actually from pennsylvania from harrisburg pennsylvania and um it, you know i got into journalism not when i was in i went to um at penn state i graduated from penn state undergraduate but my background was in history but I always just um, loved reading, you know, and I loved, you know, reading really good writing, good writers, it, you know, it, and, and it just, you know, it just seemed after I, I spent a couple of years after college kind of trying to find my way, I, I loaded trucks, I taught in a uh, special uh, school program where, where the, you know, the, the kids had uh, so-called, you know, difficult backgrounds, but it was just a great school, you know, just, you know, and then, uh, but I, my, I think my love of reading kind of, it kind of clicked at some point that, you know, this would be pretty cool just going and listening to people tell me their stories like you're doing. And then, you know, can, you know, writing it or conveying it in some fashion to people, you know, that that's, boy, you, you know, that's, um, that's such a lucky kind of uh, pursuit or anything. And I ended up applying and I went to the Medill School of Journalism, which is at Northwestern University. It's regarded as one of the best journalism schools in the country. And I ended up staying in the Chicago area. That was at, you know, that was in Evanston. And I was already doing some freelance, you know, just trying to catch on, like I'm sure you did, you know, and, um, and then it kind of grew. And then uh, eventually I got to the, um, I started covering Evanston for, we were owned different times by different owners. One time it was Time Inc., the magazine. Then it, later on it was the Sun Times. And then later on it was the Tribune. And so, um, and now I've been doing a lot of writing for another paper called the Evanston Roundtable. But um, I've been covering Evanston most of those years. And what made you stay with Evanston? Is there something that sparked you that made you want to stay? You know, I think, um, you know, I had a young daughter and a single parent. And, uh, and so I, 
you know, it would have been difficult to leave the area. I wanted to kind of stay in the area. And, um, I, you know, Evanston is just, I don't know how much time you ever spent there, but it's, it's a fascinating town because it's, it's not so large like Chicago that it's hard to get any grasp on it. It's about 80,000 people, but it's got just about everything. It's got, you know, poor people, rich people, the university. It's unfortunately, it's got crime sometimes. It's got, you know, hard luck stories. It's got happy stories. It's, it's by the lake, the beautiful lake, which I know you must be missing now. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, it's one of my favorite places. And so, uh, you know, I just ended up staying there. And so it's, it's, it's uh, I think if you're going to be, you know, you know, kind of uh, left in a city or whatever, uh, Evanston was, it is and was a great place to be. Wow. And were, who were your, like, inspirations that you looked up to or your mentors uh, going through this uh, chapter of your life in journalism? Well, probably, I, you know, I, I don't know who've been your big influences, but it's probably people that, you know, are such really, you know, just giants in the field. But, you know, other people that are just, you know, ordinary people but that, uh, really approach their job earnestly and conscientiously. And, you know, I mean, the, Mike Royko was a great columnist in Chicago. I mean, we all kind of looked up to him. Uh, I had a friend who was a great sports writer. And then he, he did what you did. He went, into, um, he went into TV. And his name was John Shulian. And, um, you know, people like that, you just, um, you just aspire to, you know, uh, uh, somehow, you know, come do your best and, and, you know, get to some sort of level that, you know, that, that you saw in these people that were just so talented. Wow. And, and tell us a little bit about your experience in working cable TV. Cause I remember you were telling me on the phone. Yeah. We did a show called the reporters. You can still find it. Uh, on Facebook every once in a while, but we haven't done a show in a while. So I'm looking forward to you helping me produce some shows because you're such a, you know, you're, you're big time. <laughs> and, um, but I, I know you'd probably just want to donate your services. And, um, but seriously, um, we did a show for a number of years. Uh, it was on public access. It was called The Reporters. And it would be like a, a kind of a news show where you'd have different guests like you're having on. Um, and you'd ask them questions and or you talk about the news of the week. And we got some really good, you know, responses from that. People, it's interesting, you know, now newspapers are and even the print material by your generation, it's it's probably not the primary thing anymore. Or it's not as, but YouTube or anything video, I mean, it can still be, is huge, you know? I mean, we, we just never really imagined, you know? It was a big deal even doing a show in those days because uh, we had guys that would lug in cameras, you know, we had a studio. This is way before you could do so much, you know, via Zoom or Facebook or whatever. I mean, even to you, it must be kind of amazing the way, you know, this whole, you know, industry has changed. Yeah. Like, like for me, I feel like uh, when I was young, my mom's uh, boss, she would make me read the newspaper. I had to read it. And it was the Chicago Tribune. And I would read it and I would have to sum it up and ask uh, critical questions towards that whatever the front page wow. and she would really pick my brain because she's like the only way you're going to grow and be aware of your own reality or what's going on in the world is you have to read the news and she would test me and if i'm not there on the of course on the weekends i wasn't able to see her but on the weekends you know i already have the newspaper already mailed to my house so i can actually read it but she'll quiz me 
like uh, on Sunday, she said, okay, so uh, what did you get from this paragraph? I was like, oh, man, <laughs> she's already on it. And I feel like uh, looking at other people that I grew up around or was a big influence, I think that's a great way of learning because I'll take a newspaper and if there was a word I didn't know, I will highlight it and look it up in the dictionary. And that's how you expand your mind and your vocabulary, sure. right? Sure. Yeah. If I grab a tablet and I look up a word, it's not the same. It doesn't transmit in your brain. It kind of just goes in your ear and goes out the other because there's no right. writing. And I right. feel it's very similar. I feel like um, even in Jewish schools, right, Orthodox schools, yeshivas, one thing I really admire is... Uh, you know, official from the shul, really sure. nice guy. He he told me this. He said that in the Jewish schools, especially Chabad, where he went, he said, you learn um, Hebrew, right? You're learning Hebrew, writing the grammatics uh, when you read the, the Parsha. And then he said, we learn English, of course, like our, you know, grammar stuff. And then we learned Spanish, right? Because it was like uh, everyone had to learn Spanish. And then you we read the Gemara, which is an Aramaic, which is a very ancient uh, language. Sure. Fish, which was shocking, is that, right, uh, you know, that's a good brother of mine. He, uh, I was able to shadow him at his uh, job where he works at a, at a hospital. And it's amazing because he understands Spanish perfectly. And most of the people that come in, the clients are Spanish speakers. And it's amazing how um, if you compare Jewish schools to uh, public schools or even other schools, it's not the same criteria. I feel like the, the Jewish schools still have that old tradition where you know, most of the, especially the Orthodox, there's no technology. Right. Um, it's all writing it down either five or 10 times, whatever you just learned. So it stays in your brain. And honestly, that's how I learned to memorize the constitution. I had to write it down so many times in order for it to stick in my brain. And I think that is so inspiring to, to see how, and also by having a system just that you don't lose your your culture, your uh, tradition because it's repetition, repetition. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the you know, as you know, one of the great biblical Bible commentators, Rashi, you know, that everyone kind of uses from the what twelfth century, and everyone uses his commentary when they're when they're reading passages, you know, of Torah or, you know, and um, he, every, there's not, he just seems like he will, every word he will be asking or have an observation or something isn't clear to him and he'll pose a, a comment or a question. Who has that anywhere close today? You know, I, I think our brains probably too are, are changing because, you know, especially even younger people, and I would imagine even in some of the more, you know, some of the schools, you know, uh, because everything is so visual and everything. And um, it's it's incredible. It really is. And, and two things I want to add. So what you said. So I, I realized there was an article I read. I, I took a master's class at Northeastern about media, media relations, something like that. And where I had to do a paper about how there was an article about how television, well, not television, actually social media and uh, Google is making us dumber, is what it said. And it's true because anybody can upload a, a, a video or uh, a paper on something that could be fake. So then you have to ask yourself, what's a valid source or what's invalid? You know, you have to. It's very tricky now because everyone's believing whatever they see, what they hear. And, and that that you got to be very careful. I think that's a that's a little crazy. 
Um, I was going to share something. Do you remember? Uh, I don't know if you met him, but he goes to our show. He used to go. Uh, you remember Rabbi Zeller, Benar Zeller? Oh, yes. What a what a dear guy. He, you know, is he, Bernie, I believe. Bernie, yeah. Rabbi, yes, he is so missed, you know. So I'm going to tell you a secret. So, well, it's not a secret now because now everybody's going to know. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I used to actually be his caregiver for about four and a half years. Okay. And it, it broke my heart that none of his family members that lived a few blocks from him would ever come see him mm -hmm. at the nursing home. And every time there was an emergency, a doctor an appointment, he had to go. I was the first one to go. Sure. So they, they called me. They're like, look, his family doesn't pick up the phone. They never answer. And you're always reliable. And one time I remember I was at work. I was working at GameStop at the time. I was still I just graduated college and I just closed the shop. It was about 1030 at night and I get a phone call and it was the nursing home. They said, look, uh, Zeller, he, he ran away. He ran out. We don't know where he's at. And I said, I already know where he's at. I'm going to go get him. I drove my car because I, I spent so much time with him. I know his favorite spots and I, I was able to find him. And a lot of things that I learned from him, you know, we will study together, you know, Torah. I still have this door that he gave me. And, you know, I, everybody used to say like, you know, what, why, why is he so always sad? And, you know, sometimes he'll get angry, but I found ways to make him laugh and make him feel good. And he goes, you know, it's it's hard because, you know, you're stuck in this place where you see the same people, but you, you sucks. I have to ask permission to leave. You know, it's, it's kind of like you don't have rights. And I said, what well, you have to understand something, these people that are with you every day, 24 seven, if you if you build relationship with them, you end up getting away with things, honestly, and you have more power if you think about it. And he's like, yeah, you're right. You're right. And this is interesting, Robert. I'm going to share with you something. So when he passed away, uh, one of his closest friends, uh, you probably know him. Uh, he's the Letterman's. They live a few blocks from our shul. Uh, he's a teacher. Uh, I forget if he works for YTT, but I'm, I'm not 100%. No, no, no. It, is it YTT? I think it's that YTT. But he he's very close with Zeller, and he told me what happened. And he told me, David, I want you to write an article about your experience with him because you, you're the only one that actually was with him almost every day. And even for Shabbat, you were always with him. You always got him dressed. Can you share a story like write in the paper and I'm going to send it to everyone in the Jewish community in our community letter? You know how we used to get those blue papers? Okay. So he's like, I'm going to spread it out. And so people can get to see the inside of how he was. And in the letter, I put how he was so smart, even though he had a stroke and he he able to use three fingers you're not going to believe this with his not dominant hand right which was his left he's a writer a righty a right hand but the right hand couldn't move with his left hand with the three fingers he typed 400 pages of his own commentary of Beratius, which is that genesis is amazing does and anybody he, have that commentary i don't know i tried asking around and nobody found it but when i was there he would show it to me and share like his insight. He was like, this is, you know, I have nothing. I'm here all day. So I'm going to just write my thoughts. And it was so beautiful because he made it almost like a poem. Yeah. Yeah. And very nice guy. I will never forget him. And, um, and one thing that to be honest, when he passed away, this is, this is very shocking. I had, the night before I woke up out of nowhere. So for some reason I woke up sweating and I felt sad for some reason. The next day in the morning, like five in the morning, uh, SC Deutsch, 
who's also a close friend of Zeller, called me. And right away, I already knew my friend passed away. Mm. And she told me he passed away. And I told her what happened. You know, I was sleeping in the middle of the night. I woke up. And she said, I think he went to say goodbye to you. Mm. That's something. And that broke my heart. And I was crying on the phone. I was sad almost every day. And the letterman called me back, the one that he wanted me to write a little nice paragraph for him. He told me, you know, even though Zeller is, you know, in, in you know, over there with, you know, in, in the heavens, right? Olam Haba, right? The world to come. He's your, to, to make you feel better, he's your attorney up there telling Hashem that this man was with me through my worst, through my good times, and he always had my back. Even though we weren't family, he was always there for me. And I that broke my heart because one saying that Bernie, Rabbi Zeller always used to say to me was, I'm your attorney, Bernie. That's what his catchphrase all the time. And I love that. And that and, and it like made me feel good. It made me uh, appreciate life because I never seen life like that. You know, he's my technically he's me. He's going to fight for you when you're up there. And I, and I love that, but yeah, he's a, one of the most humblest people I've ever met. And I, like I say, if I never went to that shul, I would never have that opportunity to meet him. He, he was really unique. You know, his commentaries, he was so, Incredible, so deep, and you know, in the way he 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 would say over something, and he would do it, and it would seem he wasn't trying to impress anybody. He wasn't going to say, "I'm not going to give you this grandiose thought that no one's ever thought," but he would find the thoughts that just so you know really hit square, and and you and you couldn't you wouldn't be able to really see so clearly unless you had his kind of depth, you know. And the other thing I, I do remember, I, it was so important for him to be at shul or at synagogue. So, I mean, that he could get there with all the pain and everything he endured. And the fact that you, we used to see you, the fact that you, you know, helped, you know, that, you know, made that possible, you know, um, I think that, you know, that just was incredible for him we we take it for granted you know we go places that we you know where we have experiences you know we're there and it's so easy to get there this and that but you know it wasn't for him you know as you know it's true one thing my mom she taught me and i i forget so back out in her country in guatemala my mom always said that if you help somebody in need you will get like a plate of food. She's like, I, I never look at the reward, but usually that's what happens. When you do good, good things come around. And when I used to help Zeller, right, for Shabbat, so many people would invite us over for Shabbat meals. And it was so nice because, you know, at first, the only homes I really knew was my family, of course, uh, Rabbi, Herb Timer, you know, a few people in the show. But Zeller really opened doors for a lot of people that I never met in the Jewish community. And sure. I, like, for example, I, I never knew the Deutsches, right? Uh, you probably right. know Donnie Deutsch. He's one of the head of uh, CN, uh, CN, CNT, something I forgot. And his daughter. Chicago which, Tower Network, I believe. There you go. That's the word. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I was yeah. trying to get the words. Yeah. Well, I, only because you got the initials <laughs> that helps me. <laughs> and, and you know, it's crazy. He, his daughter, you're not going to believe this. You ready for this? His daughter lives in Vegas, about 15 Oh, wow. So he got me connected. He said, look, David, I'm going to make sure you live in the Jewish community. I'm going to make sure you have a good show where you can go to every Shabbat. And I'm going to get you connected to my daughter. She's going to introduce you to the, the rabbi there. And um, and like I said, if it wasn't for Zeller to open those doors, I wouldn't be where I am today in Vegas. Wow, that's something. 
you know, he's he's still looking over your shoulder, I guess, you know? Yeah, no, it's true. It's yeah. true. But, oh, man, that just touched my heart. I got a little emotional. It just, right. it, it's hard. It's hard to find good people. Uh, what's the word? Hesed. He had a lot of kindness. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. Even, you know, even um, one of our, our, uh, our, uh, Hazen Silver. Right. Hazen Silver, for those who don't know, he's a Holocaust survivor, but it's, it's a beautiful, to see a man who went through so much and to still be religious and to pray and to, and when he sings, right. You remember he was oh, singing. Unbelievable. It felt like the opera. Yeah. Well, he had once performed in the opera, I believe. Oh, and wow. so, yeah. And he would, um, you remember he would say, um, you know, the, uh, the song for the new month, he would sing, you know, we, the traditional song that you sing, kind of, you know, announcing that the, the new, you know, the new month is coming in. And he got that song. It was, I think if it was written by his father, also a, you know, one of the leading cantors in Hungary. So you kind of were like, you know, you were attached to generations of just, you know, unbelievable, you know, uh piety and you know and and just you know it was it was it was pretty special you don't get that everywhere you don't you don't and, and one thing i love too is that after we did uh shakri right we will have our meal together with everybody to show and he would share something from the torah remember of the part yes yes yeah he, he i the time i mean he he had volumes of, you know, just, you know, on, on some of the, the, the great Torah scholars in his home. And, you know, and, and yeah, you really felt like, um, again, he opened up a whole world. And, and he, and almost like, a, as I recall, he would, his version of certain passages, there would be a mystical sense to them. So, you, you know, it wasn't, you, you would get off another depth that you you may not have gotten you know usually and you know and so yeah we were very lucky like that yeah like, like one thing that i remember he was teaching that was very powerful he's like we need to start changing the way we say words because words are powerful he said technically the word davin even though it means pray it also means begging and he says, we shouldn't say that. We shouldn't say Dobbin. We should say Tefillah. Right, right. Remember that? He was yeah, very yeah. particular what, what you got to say. And yes. it, it's so powerful because Tefillah is prayer, but it's a, it's not a deeper level. It's it's more deeper. And um, yeah, I never, I honestly, one of the greatest teachers of all. And, and it's shocking. Look at this. I was young studying with, with you know, I was in the table being the youngest. With, with all you guys, and it was just so beautiful. And you know what's interesting? Me getting older in high school, in high school, I didn't really have any friends in my grade level or below or higher. All my friends, believe it or not, were all my teachers at my high school. Wow. And a lot of people thought I had an old soul, but I felt like I liked people that were older than me because I felt like they had more knowledge and more experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas a young kid is kind of indecisive in what they want to do and uh, what should I eat? Like there's just a lot of things and right. it's crazy because me growing up and learning, uh, I already knew what I wanted to study for college because I was around people that are very mature and, people that were brilliant i think that kind of stayed with me that's really interesting you know um yeah i, I think it works both ways you know because um you know when we interact you know we gain something too in terms of the energy enthusiasm sincerity so you know i think it's um kind of a two-way street there I agree. I agree. It's amazing. Now, Robert, I want to, I want to pick you, your brain 
Uh, I have a little trivia question I have to ask. Sure. So it's a little good one. So what do you feel with going back to how journalism is changing so much, right? Right. Do you feel like radio newspaper won't exist no more and that everything will be virtual? You know, I don't think it'll be. I think it's going to swing back to some degree. Um, you know, because the, what they, I think what people have found, first of all, they, they want something that's a little more centered and stuff, you know, not so, you know, right of the moment. Um, but I, I think too, that, um, and I think you, maybe you experienced this on, on the Sabbath when you don't, you know, you're not really using electronic stuff. And you're just reading from from either books or whatever. They, I think the studies they've done, there's a different feel to using to that. You, it's a different experience. You're not knocking electronic reading, you know, to, on, on a, you know, but there's a different feeling between you know the, the person and and the text and everything else. And there's a, a, a different kind of intimacy with you know. And I mean, I experienced that. So I, I think there's certain things that, you know, that will kind of swing back. One of the problems is a lot of the papers, um, they were making so much money when newspapers were, you know, were what people read and everything. They were just raking it in. And then when, the, when they started getting competition, the Internet came and everything else, they started losing their classified. Uh, I think some of them sort of panicked, started cutting people, started, you know, and so you weren't getting, you know, they were kind of contributing to their, you know, their demise, you know, um, but it, it, it's, it is going to be tough. I mean, it's just such, you know, things like Facebook. I mean, you know, I mean, people, I think, have really have been trained. They want instant news. They want to be able to, you know, react in the moment and stuff. Newspapers are trying to react to that, but I don't know that you'll ever be able to, you know, do that without, you know, having some sort of a strong electronic, you know, outlet. So I don't know. You um, know. Wow. Because here's the thing. So with radio, for example, right, for people that don't know the history, radio started with the submarines. It was a way to not for music – it was a way to uh, for war, um, and then he evolved into um, now radio station, listening to the news, music, and now we have podcasts, which podcasts wasn't really known, yeah. right? Point. So I think it's interesting how podcasts has become the new trend, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah, that's that's a great point because podcasts in a, in a lot of ways, when you know. I just started really discovering them, you know, and it seemed like an old fashioned kind of, you know, of way of, you know, of dealing with information and everything, you know, conversations, sometimes no video, you know, and, um, and yet it, re it really caught on, especially, you know, if the, I mean, in terms of, you know, if they, if they I mean, if they were of substance, people maybe felt like, you know, these other extraneous things are not, you know, are not, you know, in, in my way. And I can just really concentrate on this kind of, you know, communication. So I don't know. You're right. Wow. You're right. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and like, even here's a crazy thing. What I noticed with young people is that especially younger generation, they rely everything on TikTok. TikTok Right. It's only 20 seconds video, 10 to 15 seconds. But you can get, like you said, an instant uh, moment of what's happening around the world real quick. Right. And it, it, because it shows that they have a short time expansion. It's, it's hard right. to focus. Um, like for me, when I watch a movie... I was watching a movie with my cousin. He's little. He's like about 12 or 10 years old. We're watching a movie and I'm, I like to focus and 
kind of guess what's going to happen in the next scene. I like to, you know, use my brain at the moment. And my cousin, within five or ten minutes, he pulls out the phone and, and starts checking <laughs> social media. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, dude, you're going to miss the good part. Yeah. And it, it's so sad, but that's where our, our world is coming. And you know what's interesting? Speaking of that, there's a part of the Gomorrah that I learned. And I explained this to, to Rabbi Deutsch. I explained, I said, he was explaining how in the Gomorrah, at the end of times, that the younger generation would be against the newer, uh, with the younger generation would be against the older generation. Mm -hmm. He said, we don't know what it is or what, what it's about. And I said, this is my theory. I said, it's an analogy. Think about it. Technology, there's a saying, I heard this from a quote, technology is not good, bad, or neutral. Mm -hmm. But it does separate from the both generation, the younger and the older generation, you know, and it it can honestly, I I told him this, it can be the the thing that's gonna divide mm -hmm. us in the future. That's that's kind of how I see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's um, I I have friends who you know, I, I mean. They may be Jewish, they may not be Jewish or whatever. And um, I mean, and you I'm sure you do too. And you talk to them and they have this you know, feeling that they want to be able to unhitch themselves from all these things, you know, you know, uh, it, the way we do for, you know, and, and, and other people do, you know, where they either they go on retreats or they do something like that because it's, um, you know, you just you just feel like you need that for your soul a little bit. Yeah. So I think you you may have something there. I mean, I think some young people are talking about, aren't they? There, there, there's almost a movement of you know, of going without our cell phone for a certain amount of time or this or that, and, uh, and so who knows how this is going to settle out? Yeah, yeah, it's scary. It's scary. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Robert, I'm just going to make a quick announcement and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, sure. Guys, don't forget, uh, every Friday I have my TV show, Take One, Pass It Back. Season three is finally going to be out. Uh, don't forget to stay tuned. Comedy, drama and romance, everything you need. <laughs> and it's 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 good time. And this is to, to finally officially to close the book after seven years of the making. And uh, for my fans out there, this is the Outlet to Reality, the oldest podcast in Vegas and Chicago every Tuesday. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And you know where to find me. I'm on Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, the Outlet to Reality. My TikTok is at Yakov28, and my Snapchat is Take One Pass It. And Robert, where can my fans find you? Um. You can find me. Uh, that's a good question. You know, right now I'm writing for a, the Evanston Roundtable, uh, you know, dot com. But you can also Google my name, Robert Bob Seidenberg, S-E-I-D-E-N-B-E-R-G. Find articles I've written. Uh, maybe even uh, visit the uh, find uh, videos I've done. But uh, I hope we'll be uh, working together on some, too. And uh, this has been great. And uh, I really appreciate it. Of course, of course. It's great seeing you. It's a great reunion. Way to you know have a reunion. So thank you very much. Of course, anytime. <laughs>